He's a developer and data analyst and analyst and has specialized in radar uh, remote sensing. Uh, he will be delivering the code word reconnaissance imagery reloaded, auto rectifying the 60s in high resolution. So I will uh, play the recorded session for you. Um, Mondialis, and I will be talking about Cold War Reconnaissance Imagery Reloaded, auto-rectifying the 1960s in high resolution. Specifically, this talk will be about the Corona Satellite Program by the United States in the 1960s. This is the outline of my talk. First, I would like briefly to talk about what Mondialis does before going into detail about the Corona Satellite Program and its applications. Then I will show the imaging geometry and distortions that are inherent in this data and will showcase our image rectification workflow that we developed to cope with these distortions and to auto-rectify entire corona scenes. A few brief words on Mundialis. We are a remote sensing company based in Bonn, Germany, and we are focusing on the analysis of large amounts of Earth observation data in time series using cloud environments. Mostly we use um, free data such as Copernicus Sentinel data and we are also committed to using free and open source software exclusively. With uh, Markus Metz and Markus Netela we also have two GRASS GIS core developers in our team and in our projects, we regularly contribute to the GRASS-GIS development or to the development of GRASS-GIS add-ons, as in this project. Now, I'm aware that uh, you've heard enough about Corona in the past one and a half years, but let's give this name a different meaning, as it is also the name of a satellite program that was launched by the United States in the 1960s. And the goal was to have a reconnaissance mission um, giving an idea of what's going on on the ground in high resolution, especially since it was the Cold War of the Soviet Union and their allies. The entire program consisted of 144 satellites in eight keyhole missions. Now this is of course a lot of satellites, but the mission duration of a single satellite was rather low because the satellite operated with two panoramic cameras that were operated with a physical film and once the film was used up, there was no use for the satellite mission any further. Also, the retrieval of the physical film was rather spectacular, as you see in this image. Once the film was used up, the satellite would tilt towards Earth and eject a capsule with the film inside into the Earth atmosphere, and then an aircraft would attempt to catch this capsule mid-flight. Uh, the capsule was also designed to survive in salt water for two days, such that it could also be retrieved by boat. But after two days, it would dissolve and sink in order that the data would not fall into the wrong hands. Now, the, today's value in this data lies in the spatial resolution, as you can see in this image, because the satellite flew rather low at around 160 kilometers orbit. The latest uh, Corona missions yielded effective spatial resolutions of uh, 2.75 or uh, 1.8 meters. In this image, you can already see um, individual houses, cars, vehicles and streets. So it's a ve very valuable data source dating back 60 years. This gives you another idea of why this data is so valuable. This is um, the city of Tunis in Tunisia 60 years ago versus how it looks today. And as you can see, a lot of things changed on the Earth's surface in the meantime. So with Corona, we have a unique way of um, looking back in time that no other data source um, provides us. So luckily, all this data was declassified in 1995 and is now available to download from the USGS Earth Explorer. One scene costs $30, but scenes that have been ordered previously are usually available for free, simply because the only cost is associated with filming, uh, with scanning the physical film. So any data that has been processed before can be downloaded for free. Now, what can you do with this data? As I said before, there's a lot of valuable information in there simply because it dates so much back in time, even further than the oldest Landsat archives. So, there's a lot of valuable information concerning, for example, long-term land cover mapping and monitoring. You could monitor 
vegetation or forest changes throughout the time or the urban sprawl throughout 60 years. In, in this image here, you see an, an harbor village in Algeria and compared to today, you can also see how this city sprawled enormously in the past 60 years. This information, however, is hard to automatically extract simply because in the corona data we have no spectral information and so all automatic approaches are limited to feature identification and extraction methods. However, in methods where we can focus on the qualitative interpretation of data, corona data benefits a lot. And one uh, very uh, classic example for this is archaeology. To give you an example, this is a corona scene of uh, southern Turkey from the 60s. And this scene was used to identify potential archaeological sites simply because human historical structures such as dwellings or infrastructure altered the local topography that could be visualized with uh, high resolution data like this one in order to identify potential sites that are interesting for archaeology. In the meantime, since the 60s, a lot of activity was going on on the ground, a lot of construction, land cover change. So even using today's high resolution data would not yield to this information because the land cover changed so much and buildings and cities were constructed in the meantime. Here's another zoom in and of, of an example where you see an individual farm and around it you can clearly see that there seems to be some kind of uh, human-made structure which might, which might have been a fortification. So again, a very valuable data source for archaeology. So why is corona data not that widely used yet? This is because there are massive distortions in the imagery. On the left, you see a diagram showing the imaging geometry of the satellites. It has two panoramic cameras, one tilted slightly to the front and one tilted slightly to the back. And since it is a panoramic camera, there's a lot of distortion, especially at, at the edges of one scene. So one, one scene is approximately between 200 and 250 kilometers wide and 10 to 20 kilometers um, narrow only. So if you are interested in maybe just a very small area of the Earth's surface that is um, located in the middle of such a scene, you might work well with classic linear um, autorectification methods that assume a central perspective. However, if you were to uh, autorectify an entire scene, there is an urgent need to cope with these distortions due to the panoramic effects here. Further, there is no calibration data available that you would use for today's systems, such as the position and different angles of the air or spacecraft at the time of the acquisition. This was the 1960s and such data could not be collected, so any transformation model needs to um, estimate these parameters. Here's an example of different autorectification methods of the same corona scene. On top you see just a linear classic uh, autorectification approach applied and on the bottom you see an image where the panoramic uh, distortion has been accounted for and in the top image you can clearly see that the offset especially at the edges is in the order of magnitude of tens of kilometers so this is not an appropriate way to go to autorectify an entire scene. So what is necessary is a transformation model that deals with this and that is, this is done basically by a cylindrical shape that represents the physical film surface um, to be put in this transformation model. And such a model was already in introduced in literature by Zone uh, et al. in 2004. But however, in this project, we didn't find any implementation in free and open source software. Because of this, we implemented this model in the iAuto photo suit in GRASS-GIS. So the iAuto photo suit is the standard rectification workflow in order to auto rectify aerial or spaceborne images, normally assuming um, just the central perspective cameras, but now we extended it to also be able to cope with this panoramic distortions. It is part of GRASS-GIS from version 7.9 onwards. So if you install GRASS-GIS um, locally on your computer, you already have all the software you need to auto rectify this, uh, the corona scenes. And of course, it's free and open source. Finally, I would like to show you the entire workflow of rectifying an, um, an entire corona scene. It begins with the scene recomposition, because if you order a scene from the USGS
My name is Guido Riembauer from Mondialis and I will be talking about um, the city of the example for this is archaeology and one tilted slightly to the different angles of the So what is necessary is a transformation model that deals with this and that is, this is done basically by a cylindrical shape that represents the physical film surface um, to be put in this transformation model. And such a model was already in introduced in literature by Zohn et al. in 2004. But however, in this project, we didn't find any implementation in free and open source software. Because of this, we implemented this model in the iAuto photo suit in GRASS-GIS. So the iAuto photo suit is the standard rectification workflow in order to auto rectify aerial or space-borne images normally assuming um, just the central perspective cameras, but now we extended it to also be able to cope with this panoramic distortions. It is part of GRASS-GIS from version 7.9 onwards. So if you install GRASS-GIS um, locally on your computer, you already have all the software you need to auto-rectify uh, the corona scenes. And of course, it's free and open source. Finally, I would like to show you the entire workflow of rectifying an, um, an entire corona scene. It begins with the scene recomposition, because if you order a scene from the USGS Earth Explorer, what you get is not one entire TIFF file, but you get four individual TIFF files that are split, but have some overlap. This is simply because the film cannot be scanned at, in one go, but it's scanned in four individual um, rounds and there's, on each scene pair is a significant overlap in order to recompose the scene. So you could use automatic stitching methods or just go with a simulated auto-rectification approach by finding points that are the same in, in the respective image pairs. Next comes the part that is most time consuming, and this is the collection of ground control points. This means in order to auto rectify your scene, you would need a set of points in your corona imagery that you can assign a specific and precise location to. For this, obviously, one needs reference data. Um, if there's infrastructure, for example, um, which is, which is always the best choice. Then you could use OpenStreetMap data as in this example. Um, you can use, for example, road crossings or bridges. In this case, we used uh, a crossing at the airport of Tunis of the runway. And this crossing can also clearly be identified in the same or in the corresponding corona scene here. However, this is not always possible. And sometimes there is no infrastructure in your scene. And then you would need to go for natural features, such as, for example, river confluences, as, as in this example, or uh, characteristic rock formations, for example. But again, you would need to really have a close look to find this specific point in both um, data sources here in the respective corona scene. We found that uh, collecting 20 to 40 ground control points over an entire scene is enough to give a good auto rectification, but it would be necessary to distribute these points as uh, evenly as possible over the image in order um, to have a, a good result of the auto rectification in each part of the image. With this data, now we can do the actual auto rectification and for this we need some additional inputs. So first we need the patch draw scene from step one. Then we need some basic scene metadata. Um, when you order a scene from the USGS Earth Explorer, you get some very basic corner co coordinates of the scene, which are not very precise, but they give you a very rough idea of where you are on the Earth. And this is important for the um, parameter estimation of the transformation model in order to have some very basic initial guesses. Then you need a digital elevation model in order to cope with um, distortions due to topography and you need the set of ground control points. With all these input, you can then um, estimate the parameters of the transformation model. And by doing this, each of the ground control points gets assigned a root mean square error that depicts uh, how well this point fits to the overall model. With this, you can um, identify points that are perhaps uh, that have a high error and uh, do not fit well to the model, maybe because um, in the ground control point collection step, some points were misplaced. 
So you can use this step to iteratively adapt your set of ground control points until you're satisfied with the overall root mean square error. And this, what is achievable, what we found is more or less five to 10 meters root mean square error in the models is realistic. Then you can run the actual auto rectification and yield the final scene. This is then how it looks like if you do it for an entire strip of scenes. This is the Nile Valley in Sudan, which is also very interesting from an archaeological point of view. And using multiple scenes, you can also use the overlap of individual scenes to identify ground control points that are visible in, in each scene pair in order to avoid double work. This brings me to the end of my talk. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope I made you a bit curious on the Corona mission and the data, and also um, made you curious about trying GRASS.js for its rectification. And now I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, um, first uh, apologies for the video cut. Uh, just my bad. Um, and also apologies for the, if you have issues listening the audio, because I didn't have, uh, maybe because I was using the, uh, the earbuds, um, but I hope you get a grasp of the, of the talk. Um, so, okay, we have one question. Um, is the output being used professionally? Was this a speculative project or did someone commission it? If you can talk about that. <laughs> yes, thank you very much for the question. Also, thank you for the uh, for hosting the presentation. Um, yes, uh, so that was uh, we had a customer that was interested in the Corona scenes for archaeological purposes. Although I can't point out the exact one, but yeah, it is being used um, professionally and also in the let's say in the archaeological world. World, um, this Corona data set is be, is known very well, so it's a far far used uh, data set. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, or, well, maybe the first one is the, yeah, you hate it always, the com comment. <laughs> um, the Apart from archaeology, have you uh, identified other potential use cases? Like, I can imagine, for example, coastal uh, evolution or line coast uh, uh, changes, for example. Uh, yes, of course. Um, all kinds of land cover mapping basically is applicable for this. And it's very interesting because this data goes back a long time. Um, for example, there was also a study not conducted by us, but um, by others using this data that also looked at um, forest change in the Amazon basin. Now you can even look at data way back from the 60s, which is a nice extension to, let's say, the Land Landsat archive, for example. So there's far more use cases. Um, than archaeology, but um, as I also said in the talk, it's a bit hard to automate this simply because we only have, uh, so we have the distortions and second, we have only one spectral channel, if you will, which is not even yeah. a proper spectral channel, but a physical film. Um, you haven't mentioned exactly uh, or shown any uh, coverage map of the imagery. Is this uh, imagery worldwide or because you've seen, you've shown uh, data from Africa mostly, but actually you mentioned now South America, and I understand also uh, Russia and uh, the Cold War areas of interest. But there are also data from Europe, North America. Yes, there's a lot of data from North America. So in in general, it is worldwide um, was available. <laughs> so the focus, for historical reasons, obviously was on the on Asia and the Soviet Union and also the Middle East which is also very interesting for archaeological purposes, but there are um, data available for North America, Europe, um, literally anywhere on, in the world. At some places, there might only be one specific scene. At others, there are hundreds. It really differs a lot. OK, uh, I have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, did you try AI super resolution method? Super resolution to identify specific features? So we. Um, no, because we didn't analyze the data itself yet, but this we only prepared it for the rectification. But this would be a very interesting approach to identify features and objects in the data itself. But again, this is then the applic application world that we didn't touch in this project yet. Mm -hmm. 
Another question is, have you looked at AIM's stereo pipelines method for working with KH and how it compares to your methods? Um, no, we have looked at, um, I'm not sure if that's the one, there, there is one from, I think the University of Oklahoma. I'm not sure if that's the one uh, that this question refers to. There is a stereo pipeline. Um, we also tried to use it, but we weren't able to contact or we didn't give any get any feedback from the hosts of this platform because there is a serv sorry there's a service that um, allows you to auto rectify corona scenes online also but we weren't able to um, get in contact with, with the uh -huh. hosts of the system unfortunately okay um uh, there was a question that gets removed from the chat or no uh, well, I have one. This, uh, are the results of your uh, studies, the rectified images, available somewhere? Or well, it's just owned by the ca your customer? Exactly. And perhaps, I'm not sure about this, but the customer may um, publish them as well, in a, for example, in a WMS or, or somewhere. But in general, um, what I would like to point out again is that also the data you can get from the USDS Earth Explorer, so the raw data is available. And there's also free data already there. Mm -hmm. OK, there are uh, folks already sharing the coverage in the chat for anyone interested. Um, ah, OK, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Um, the, uh, uh, is there any community effort to georectify this data? So to outsource, I guess, uh, uh, the time consuming human dependent part of the process? I think there there was there is this uh, Corona Cast project that is also the one with the online uh, possibility Service to auto rectify. Mm -hmm. Exactly, um, but I don't know if this project is still ongoing. So from our side, there there we didn't put any effort in the community building here. But in theory, of course, it would be very nice because this is a very rich data source, and everybody is just waiting to have it auto rectified to get started and. The auto rectification is really what what uh, hinders the analysis ready data you know yeah I get any, you. any any um initiative that would like to use this workflow is very welcome of course and um we'd be happy to to help them yeah i i can imagine a kind of a web service to help creating the control the ground control points mm -hmm. okay uh any how good is the special accuracy? Um, yeah, this this really depends. Um, so in the best scenes, we would get an offset of uh, around five meters for the entire scene. Um, there are, will be regions where there's absolutely no offset and you have a perfect match. And there will be regions where you have 20, 30 meters offset. Um, however, there are some scenes that can't be really auto rectified at all or where we still have hundreds of meters of offset in in there simply because there are still so many factors like the absolute position and movement of the spacecraft that was simply not documented in that time so mm -hmm. there might be occasionally a scene where these factors are really hard to come by with, with our, also with our auto rectification method yeah i can imagine it has to be challenging to work with data from the 70s or <laughs> the 60s Okay. Um, any any other questions from the audience? Okay. Then uh, thank you, thank you very much, Guido. Um, um, yeah, very nice and very interesting project. Um, uh, now we have five minutes for uh, Marty. So see you, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.